Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Andrews, and he'll talk about polynomial identity testing. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about polynomial identity testing. This is a, this is a problem in computer science. It's an important problem. It's one of my favorite problems, and I hope that by the end of this talk, you like it as well and think that it's a nice problem to think about. So to motivate what this problem is about, you know, I work in computational complexity theory. What is this area about? You know, viewed from a thousand feet up, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand if I have two different computational resources, A and B, how do these resources compare to one another? So for example, if I can solve a problem quickly, can I solve it using a small amount of memory? How do sequential and parallel computation compare? How do deterministic and randomized computation compare? And often it's fruitful to study this question by instead looking at a somewhat related question prime, which is if I have some resource A, I have some problem X that I want to solve, how much of A do I need to solve X? And if you pick the right choice of problem, it turns out this, this second question will tell you a lot about the answer to the first. And so one thing that I'm interested in and, and will be the subject of this talk is, what's the role of randomness in computation? Do we need, you know, does randomness allow us to compute things more efficiently than we could deterministically? Uh, and one interesting lens on this problem, or on, on this question is through the problem of polynomial identity testing. So what is this problem? So I give you some multivariate polynomial over the rational numbers. And I ask you to tell me, is this polynomial the zero polynomial? Okay, now, if I give you this polynomial as a list of you know, monomials and coefficients, then this problem is stupidly easy. You just check that all the coefficients are zero. But if I give you the polynomial in a more succinct representation, then the problem becomes more interesting and also more difficult. So there's work of Valiant from the 70s that shows, you know, whatever <coughs> succinct representation of a polynomial you might consider, you might as well consider the following one, where I give you the determinant of some symbolic matrix. So here are these AIs, these are rational matrices, and I multiply each AI by some fresh variable XI, and I take their sum. Okay, this is some matrix where every entry is a linear form in the variables, and I want to know, is its determinant the zero polynomial or is it non-zero? Now, how would you solve this? Well, of course, you could expand the determinant, you know, look at every single term, check that they all cancel, but this is going to take you a ridiculous amount of time. There's something more efficient you can do if you allow yourself the use of randomness. In fact, the algorithm is so simple, here it is. You're going to sample a random point and evaluate the symbolic determinant at that point. Right? This sort of representation allows you to evaluate the polynomial easily because I just plug in values for the x's and then I compute this determinant as some actual number. Now, I look at this random evaluation and I tell you that the polynomial is zero exactly when I see a zero evaluation. So why does this work? Well, if the polynomial is zero, you always see zero evaluations, that's easy. And if the polynomial is not zero, then it's very likely that this point I sampled is going to lie outside the zero set of the polynomial. Now, if you were to sample, say, a random point from a unit cube, then with probability one, you're outside the, the zero set. But we're doing this on a computer. We need to discretize things. So I'll just pick a, a random uh, point from some integer grid. And this, this algorithm, as I wrote it down, will make errors about 10% of the time. Now, this is a fast algorithm. It's a simple algorithm, but it uses a lot of randomness. If you want to do this sampling, you need to spend about n log n random bits to sample one of these points. Can you do better? Can you find an efficient algorithm that uses less randomness than this? That's the question that I'm interested in. Now, before I tell you something about reducing the amount of randomness here, let me give you an example application of this problem to really convince you there's something going on here. So the application I want to tell you about, it's a bit surprising if you've never seen it before. It's an application to a problem in graph theory, which is perfect matching on bipartite. So I give you a bipartite graph. So there are some vertices on the left, vertices on the right, and edges going between them. And I want to know if there's a perfect matching in this graph. So I want to find a set of edges that pairs up the vertices on the left with the vertices on the right. Now this is a well-studied problem. You learn about it in undergraduate algorithms. It's rather easy to solve, but these are all combinatorial algorithms that, that have been known for many years. Let me show you an algebraic algorithm for this problem. So we'll take this graph. <laughs> And you'll instead write down some symbolic matrix. So here the ij entry is a fresh variable if there's an edge between the vertices i on the left, j on the right, and it's a zero otherwise. Now, why would you do this? 
Well, Edmonds observed that th this graph G has a perfect matching exactly when the determinant of this symbolic matrix is not the zero polynomial. And why is that? Well, every term in the determinant, when you expand it out, would correspond to some matching of the vertices in this graph on the left. And because all of these terms in the determinant are on disjoint variables, you can never have any cancellations. So for example, this matching on the left corresponds to the monomial where you multiply these three variables on the right. Okay, so this is great. We solved a problem that we already knew how to solve, and we're solving it in a randomized fashion, which is maybe even worse. We know deterministic algorithms for this problem. But in fact, you can buy something with this. You can design a parallel algorithm for this problem. Because what, is, what are you doing here? You're forming some matrix, sampling some random numbers, and then computing a determinant. And we know how to compute the determinant efficiently in parallel. So this gives you a parallel algorithm for bipartite matching, where all the other combinatorial algorithms we know are very inherently sequential. They proceed in steps where you find one new edge of the matching at a time. So this seems very interesting. And you know, it would be a really interesting task to design a deterministic parallel algorithm for this problem. And there's been work done on this, and in some sense, we're nearly there. So that's one application of this problem. You can solve problems in combinatorics by doing something in algebra, which is, you know, I thought this was very nice the first time I saw this. Okay. So now let me tell you about actually reducing the amount of randomness you need to solve this problem. So just recall, you know, we saw an algorithm that solved this problem in the general case using about n log n bits of randomness. What would it take to use less randomness to solve this problem? There's this really nice work by Kabanetsin and Pagliazzo from 2004 that in some sense answers this question. If you want to find an efficient algorithm for this problem that uses only n to the epsilon random bits, where you can think of epsilon as like a 10th, 100th, you know, some small number, you can do this if and only if you can prove some version of p not equal to np for algebraic computation. So in one sense, our, our job of de-randomizing this problem is extremely easy. We just have to prove that p is different from np. Uh, why? What is p equals not n p is a problem that's independent of foil algebraic. What, what is foil algebraic computation? So I want to compute the permanent polynomial. Yeah, I understand, but yeah, uh, is it is that necessary? It's not equivalent to p is not n. Um, so it's a it's a variation on p not equal n p. So it's it's different. Um, under something like generalized Riemann hypothesis, this is implied by the standard p not equal to n. So it's true. Okay, so I mean, you can take a view that this is just true, but let's try to find it. I'm just trying to understand the distinction. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is something which is slightly weaker than the standard p versus n. Okay. Um, so on the one hand, this tells us what to do. On the other hand, it tells us our job is very, very difficult. Um, that if we want to use less randomness to solve this problem, we're kind of stuck. We have to solve a very hard problem. But what's interesting about this is a similar phenomenon occurs even for special cases of this problem. So what do I mean by this? On the left, we have some question about de-randomization. And on the right, we have some question about computational lower bounds. And it turns out there's a connection between de-randomization and lower bounds, even in restricted settings. So I want to tell you about one restricted setting where we actually know something about this problem. So the restricted setting I want to tell you about uh, is the following. So if you were to write down a polynomial as just a sum of monomials, I could represent it as sort of a, a depth two formula. Right? You have some summation at the top. You have a bunch of products in the middle, and every product corresponds to some monomial. And you know, maybe you can put some coefficients from your field on these edges to indicate the coefficients of the polynomial. That's fine. We understand the identity testing problem here very easily. So let's add one more layer to this computation. Instead of taking sums of products of the variables, I want to look at sums of products of linear combinations of the variables. So already, this is a more succinct representation of polynomials, and this is something we don't entirely understand yet. Um, so what can you say about this? So in fact, there was this really wonderful breakthrough work just a few years ago that proved computational lower bounds for this kind of representation of polynomials. So we know that 
if you were to try and write, say, the determinant as one of these depth three formulas, you just cannot efficiently represent the determinant this way. You have to pay a lot to write the determinant as one of these formulas. And as a corollary of that, you can actually design efficient identity testing algorithms when I, when I represent a polynomial in this way, where these algorithms are only going to use something like n to the epsilon random base. So we actually have some progress here. Um, there are two algorithms for this. One was given as a corollary of the, this lower bound by the Maya, Srinivasan, and Tabana. And then in some work later, together with Michael Forbes, we designed a different algorithm. It also uses this, this lower bound in a crucial way, but the algorithm is different and maybe a little bit more explicit in its description. Um, so I want to tell you what this algorithm does, or at least one step of this algorithm, and give you some idea why do lower bounds help for this de-randomization test. So here's an algorithm that actually surprisingly works. So if you remember, in the general case, we sampled a random point and we evaluated at that random point. And here, I'm going to think of this polynomial instead of a vector of n variables, let's say it has a, a matrix of variables, you know, square root n by square root n. I'm going to sample a point which is some low rank matrix, and then I'll evaluate at that low rank matrix. And because I'm sampling from a more structured set, I can save on the amount of randomness I need. Now, the epsilon here will depend on what exactly I mean by low rank. Uh, let's not worry about that. The point is, this is some efficient algorithm. We're sampling from a more structured set, and we're saving on the randomness. But why should this work? Well, let's think about this. So if this algorithm were to fail, what does that mean? <coughs> I have some small formula, and every time I throw a low rank matrix at it, it spits back 0. So really what it's doing is we have some formula that computes some identity of low rank matrices. And if you want, you could replace the word low rank with singular. And this is essentially saying, you know, this formula is something like the determinant. And in fact, that's true even when I have the words low rank here, we were able to show that you can massage whatever this identity is into an honest to goodness representation of the determinant. You can get a small formula out of this that would compute the determinant, but we already saw we cannot do this. And so what this is in some sense saying is you have this lower bound that these formulas can't compute determinants efficiently. So let's try to find a test that would require them to compute the determinant in order to break this test. Now, these ideas, I'm showing you them in some restricted setting. Uh, but it turns out they're useful even for the fully general setting of this problem. So I want to tell you just a little bit about that. And in order to do that, I need to tell you about one more problem from computer science, but I think it's familiar to everyone, matrix multiplication. So you know, I don't need to define this, but you know, if I give you two n by n matrices, I want you to multiply them. And how many arithmetic operations, additions and multiplications do you need to multiply these two matrices? Now, if you use the textbook definition, you can multiply them using n cubed operations. Can you do better? Why would you want to do better, first of all? Well, it turns out this governs the complexity of many tasks in linear algebra. If you want to invert a matrix, solve a linear system of equations, optimize a linear program, all of these tasks you can do quickly if you can multiply matrices quickly. So what do we know about this? There's a whole industry of designing matrix multiplication algorithms. Started with Strassen in 1969, and in fact, the, the current record is just a few months old. You can multiply n by n matrices using about n to the 2.371 operations. And it's a major open question. Do n squared operations suffice? Or do you actually need to pay a little bit more to multiply matrices? This is a major question. And using some of the ideas from the previous slide, you can actually show a connection between the complexity of multiplying matrices and this question of de-randomizing polynomial identity testing. So the last thing I'll tell you is, if you could actually prove some kind of lower bound for matrix multiplication, if you need n to the 2 plus epsilon operations, then you can use this to design an efficient algorithm for the general case of identity testing that's only going to use something like n to the 1 minus delta random base. So just to conclude, randomness, computational lower bounds, these are intimately connected. There's this wonderful problem of polynomial identity testing. and I hope that, uh, I mean, if you have ideas about it, I'd love to talk about it. So that's it. Thank you. Questions? 
Is it clear that n squared is also the value? Yes. Yeah. Right. You, you, you need to write n squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is what is delta dependent on? Sorry. Um, what is delta dependent on? Um, there's some linear dependence. So the, the implication that you ended with, the yes. left-hand side is like, there isn't an algorithm, and the right-hand side is there is an algorithm. Exactly. Can you say something about the mechanism by which that? Yes. Would? Yes, yes, yes. So it's the same mechanism here, where I'm going to give you some candidate algorithm for this de-randomization task. If it failed, well, you should think of that as there's some algorithm that broke my test. There's some interesting algorithm that broke my test. And then I'm going to do a lot of massaging around of that to turn it into a matrix multiplication algorithm. I don't know if that helps to. Is the conversion, can, is it, can you actually produce the thing? Or is yeah. it just the existence? Um, so if you give me the, uh, the algorithm that breaks my test, I can very explicitly give you a matrix multiplication algorithm. So deterministic reduction. Uh, yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you said that the, the three level evaluation of determinant is can't do it efficiently. What exactly do you mean by efficient? Um, so if I want to compute an n by n determinant, I cannot write down a polynomial size depth three formula. So polynomial in n uh, that, that would compute that determinant. Uh, comments, solutions, questions? Abhi? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, let's thank the speaker.